What's up everybody? Hope you all had a fantastic weekend. Uh, I definitely did. It was heavily motorsport based. Uh, I was at the Goodwood Festival of Speed on um, Friday, uh, which was epic as ever. First weekend or first time in a couple of seasons that I haven't been working at that. Last couple of years I've been presenting the Sky Sports Show. Um, this weekend I wasn't working for or at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, which allowed me to go there as a fan. And I did that with, uh, with my two boys, Leo and Rex. We went down there, had a great day. It's such a brilliant event. Um, if you went along, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know. Uh, there was some fantastic stuff there. Great cars, great action on track as well. So really enjoyed that. And then Saturday and Sunday, I was presenting the Formula E radio show and commentating on, the, on both races from New York City. So a really, really great weekend. If you watched any of the Formula E action, let me know what you think. I've got to say, it was one of the best weekends racing I think I've seen for a long time. Exciting, dramatic, controversial. It had pretty much everything that you would want from any, any kind of live sporting event. So real privilege to be commentating on that. And of course, both championships were wrapped up as well in New York City. Uh, Jean-Éric Byrne taking the driver's title and Audi Sport at taking the team's championship after an epic battle over two days. It is Q&A Monday though, and as ever, lots of you have sent in some great questions, uh, both on Formula E and on Formula One, so let's get cracking into some of those. Well, this has got pretty overgrown since I last came down here. Uh, okay, Dustin Grinnell, let's start it off with you. Uh, it says, how does the constructor's points work uh, constructors and drivers points rather work in both Formula One and Formula E. Well, I know lots of you will know the answer to this, but some of you won't. So uh, actually both work very similarly for the points scored in a race. Uh, that means the 25 points go to the driver who wins and then one point for the person who comes in 10th place. So the top 10 scoring points in both championships. In Formula E, there is a slight twist because there are also three points awarded for the Julius Baer pole position winner and one point awarded to the driver who scores the fastest lap and finishes inside the top 10 point scoring positions. So that's the slight twist for Formula E, but the main scoring positions uh, from first place down to 10th are exactly the same. Mark Hennan says, why isn't there a British Formula E race and where would you like to see one if there was? Uh, well, we used to have a British Formula E race. It was in Battersea Park in London. Uh, in season one and season two. Uh, it wasn't the best track, I have to say, but it was a great event and it was great to be in London. So I'd love to see it come back. I guess the dream would be to have it in central London, uh, around some of the big iconic places in the centre of town, the, uh, the Mall, around Trafalgar Square, uh, perhaps past the Houses of Parliament, over one of the bridges. That would be spectacular, but it's just so difficult to put a race on. I do remember when Formula E were doing it last time in London, of all the cities that we go around the world, and we go to some spectacular places in Formula E. Uh, I mean, Paris is one of the best because it is right in the centre, great location for a race. Um, but the guys who organise these things said to me at the time that London was one of the most difficult places to put on a race because of so much bureaucracy and red tape involved in making it happen. Formula One have tried to do it there in the past, and it just seems so difficult. So a much more likely scenario is that we might see a race perhaps somewhere on the outskirts of town, perhaps like around the Olympic Park in London. That's been talked about in the past. Um, there's been recent talk about uh, a race happening on the streets of Birmingham. Um, neither of those things have, have been confirmed or look closer to being confirmed just yet. And certainly we won't be going back and having a British race next season because that calendar is now settled. But it would be great. I would love to see it. Where would you like to see a Formula E race? You let me know um, in the UK or anywhere. Uh, we're going to some new locations in season five, starting the season in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. Um, and so we've got a new race in China as well. So you let me know. Where would you love to see a Formula E race? I would love to see it bang in the middle of central London. Um, whether it can happen or not, though, is another matter. Uo Zomi, uh, apologies if I've pronounced that wrong, um, but uh, he says, and referring to yesterday's uh, Formula E race in New York City, 
uh, where Andre Lotterer was given a 10 second stop and go penalty for a jump start at the beginning of the race. Um, he says, why or wasn't he allowed to take that under the full course yellow that came out later in the race because it would have saved him a lot of time. Um, the facts are that you are actually allowed to take that penalty under a full course yellow. You're not allowed to take it during a safety car period, but a full course yellow would have been fine. However, the rules do state when you're issued the penalty uh, by the stewards during the race, from the moment that penalty is announced on the timing screens, you're only allowed to cross the timing line two more times before you must stop in the pits and take that penalty. So that was why he had to take it when he did. It did cost him considerably uh, in the race and it ultimately probably cost a cheetah uh, the team's championship because Lotter was then out of the really high point scoring positions and they lost out in the team's championship by just two points. So a costly error at the start of the race for Lotter. Ron Knox says, do Formula E drivers require a super license? Uh, no, they don't. Um, super licenses are only for Formula One. However, uh, doing well in Formula E will help you qualify for a super license. Tim Burton says, hi Elvis, quick question. When an F1 driver removes the steering wheel, what's the circular disc they take off first? And this applies actually to most uh, racing championships, certainly single-seater racing championships where you've got to remove the steering wheel to get out the car. Uh, it's not a silly question at all. They actually don't remove a circular disc, they don't take anything off, but behind the steering wheel on a Formula One car is a circular collar uh, which essentially retains the, the wheel securely onto the column. It's a, a collar that's sprung-loaded, the driver pulls back on that circular collar and that releases uh, a set of ball bearings, which when the collar's closed, uh, the collar securely holds a series of ball bearings into a groove in the steering column, and that's what locks the wheel in place securely. So by pulling back on the spring-loaded collar, it releases the ball bearings from the little groove channel around uh, the circumference of the steering column, and allows the driver then to pull back on the entire wheel, and it will release itself from the column and come off in his hands. So, they're not taking anything off, they just, uh, that collar stays with the steering wheel at all times. Uh, and when they put the steering wheel back on, they also have to pull back on that, uh, that little spring-loaded collar, slot the wheel into place, let go of the collar, and it re-locks the steering wheel onto the steering column, nice and tight, nice and secure. In the middle of all that, right down the centre of the column, are all of the electrical connections. So the driver doesn't have to do anything with those. If the steering wheel is mated properly to the column, the electrical connections are all made automatically and everything, the switches, the dials, the information that he gets on his steering wheel all happens without him having to do anything else other than fit the wheel properly. Abel Oy says, uh, I heard that the Generation 2 cars in Formula E will have batteries that will last the whole race. Does that mean no more pit stops and does it diminish from the strategy side of that kind of motor racing? Okay, so yes, the new Generation 2 cars have a new battery supplied by McLaren. The old one was supplied by Williams. So the new one uh, from season five, starting in December, will, will last the entire race. So that does mean that uh, there'll be no more mid-race car swaps that we've had so far. Um, uh, first of all, let me just say, that's a, that's a wonderful testament to the way that the technology, the battery technology has developed over the first four seasons of Formula E that we've got to a point now where we've got you know, a much more energy dense battery coming into the sport, which will allow the cars to go faster and to complete the entire race distance. So that's great news. In terms of strategy, it's a good point because yes, it does take away one element of the race in terms of the mid-race car swap, which people have grown to enjoy and does add, add an element of strategy. So in response to that, the rule makers have come up with a new solution for next year and actually what they've come up with is quite interesting it's a dual power modes for next year so during the race next season uh, drivers will have obviously increased power with the new battery but they'll have two different power modes uh, which they will be able to access at different points in the race still being absolutely finalized and it'll be slightly different for each circuit but there will be activation zones on each track where the higher power modes are able to be, be used to be accessed by the drivers. So they have in, included a strategic, a strategic element for next year's racing. It'll be slightly different to this year, but different can be great.
Let's wait and see. Midhun Harry Kumar says, uh, I was wondering which engines are used in McLaren road cars and can they produce their own Formula One engine? Um, so in the McLaren road cars, the engine is produced uh, by a company called Ricardo, so a third party. And can they produce their own Formula One engines? The answer, of course, is yes, they can. Um, to do something like that in-house is, I've got to say, is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly expensive. Um, and that's why at the moment you've only got the major manufacturers doing that in Mercedes, Ferrari, Renault and Honda. Because the investment required to make that work is just astronomical as it stands in Formula One. Um, the rules for 2021, the big rule change coming for 2021, was originally intended to try and make the whole sport more accessible to new manufacturers, to new engine suppliers as well. They were trying to make it cheaper, they were trying to make it slightly easier uh, to get involved and become an engine supplier or manufacturer. Uh, and some of the smaller teams, potentially like McLaren, uh, could have well been looking at that as a real opportunity to perhaps go ahead and make their own engines. And if they did that, they wouldn't do it necessarily themselves inside MTC, of course, there just isn't space or infrastructure for that. But they would employ a third party, maybe like Ricardo, who produce their road car engines to do exactly that. People like Cosworth, people like Aston Martin, were also looking at coming in. As it stands now, uh, and we don't yet have a definitive 2021 structure yet, it's looking more and more likely that actually it's not going to be that much cheaper, that much more easy or accessible to come in uh, in 2021 as an engine manufacturer. And we're already seeing some of the teams who were originally interested, teams like, or people like Porsche, starting to, to look like they might actually back out of that uh, and actually not see it as a viable business interest anymore. So it'll be a real shame if that, uh, that is the way it goes, because I think it was a real opportunity for a big reset in Formula One. And actually the original plans look like they're being more and more diluted as time goes by. So in answer to your question, um, yes, it is possible for anybody to produce their own Formula One engines, but they need a huge amount of uh, investment, need a huge amount of time because it's not a quick project to do and they need the infrastructure and the support to do it. And the only way anybody is going to commit to all of those things is if there is a long term plan where they know the direction that Formula One engines are intended to go in the future. There's no point committing to that if you've only got a guarantee that they'll stay as they are for the next two years, for example. So they need a long term technical roadmap as to where the sport's going in terms of power units before anybody is even going to consider committing to a project of that scale. Right, Graham C says, I was wondering why relaxing the rules on the old ground effect designs hasn't apparently been considered as an option to alleviate the issues with the current aero affecting cars following and overtaking. Uh, well, actually it has been considered. Um, the, the, the department of F1 set up by Ross Braun, uh, which is being led uh, largely by Pat Simmons and a team of highly qualified people are looking at all of those kind of options. But yes, ground effect, lots of people have mentioned this, should we be going towards ground effect rather than over the top wings? If you don't know what ground effect is, back in the old days of the sort of 70s um, and 80s, we had ground effect cars, which had little side skirts uh, sort of dropping down from the, the outskirts, the outside edges of the floor, sealing the floor of the car to the ground, the racetrack. And what that did was accelerate the airflow underneath the car to incredible levels, uh, maximising the efficiency of the diffuser at the back and sucking the car onto the floor. It was a really, really effective way of doing it and it created huge amounts of downforce and didn't really rely heavily on the over-the-top front and rear wings uh, that we do today that we know create such a big um, turbulent weight behind it that makes it very difficult for cars to follow and therefore overtake. So it has been considered for whatever reason, and I don't know the absolute reason, they haven't decided to go in that direction as yet, but there's no reason to say that can't ever happen again. Let's keep an eye on it, but good point.
Right, so finally, let's finish on this one. Uh, Fiddler Steve says, thoughts on fan boost. It seems that most serious motorsport fans see it as a gimmick that Formula E simply doesn't need. Um, okay, discuss. Um, for, uh, fan boost, well, if you don't know what fan boost is, first of all, it's a, um, a sort of uh, an idea in Formula E that's been there since the beginning where people at home, fans of drivers and of teams are able to vote in the week leading up to the race for their favorite driver. And the top three drivers who get the most votes across social media or the Formula E website will get a small boost, a small extra amount of energy to be used in their second car uh, towards the second half of the race. Now, that's been controversial. Some people have exactly, as you say, seen it as a gimmick. Um, I understand that, absolutely get that, uh, that feeling because it's unlike anything else you've seen in other motorsports. The theory behind it, I like because the idea was to encourage teams and drivers to be very active across social media, to try and campaign almost for votes, which in theory would be good for fans. It would be good for fans of those drivers and fans of the sport because they're getting more interaction, more activation from their favorite teams and drivers across the world of social media. So that's great. And that has happened to some extent. The amount of energy that they get in the race or the power boost that it gives them for a short period of time is minimal. So it's not going to be game changing at any point. It maybe gives them a slight opportunity uh, to, to affect an overtake. Maybe it gives them uh, an opportunity to defend against an overtake. It doesn't generally change the outcome of a race very much. We have seen in the first four seasons, only I think a handful, no more than a handful of races uh, won by using the fan boost to get past another driver. So that tells you how impactful it's been. Now, is it a gimmick? Uh, yes, it's a gimmick. Is it a good gimmick? Do you know what? I actually, I applaud Formula E for trying different things like this. And you know, this whole thing has developed over the first four years. So it's been tweaked ever so slightly at different times. And I actually, th I think it's great that they've been brave enough to try something that's been so controversial and so new. Has it worked? I'm not sure it's worked as well as anybody hoped because I don't think, partly I think the teams and drivers haven't embraced it uh, enough on social media. They could have perhaps done more, in my opinion. Um, but also I think it's been open to, the system has been open to abuse to some extent. There have been lots of rumours at different times about um, teams employing bots to vote for them uh, in earlier seasons um, to, to, to kind of maximise the votes that they can get because it brings performance to the car. As soon as you offer something like that that will bring performance to a car, a team will go to whatever lengths they can, as we all know, to make that happen. So yes, it's a gimmick. Do we need it? No, we don't need it. Do I like it? I don't like it and I don't not like it. I don't think it's any reason to get upset about Formula E over it. It's not controversial enough for that. I can take it or leave it, but I think the idea behind it was a good one. Right, thank you very much for all of your questions. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you think I'm talking complete rubbish, because I know some of you will, particularly on the controversial subject of Formula E and particularly fan boost. But do let me know. Thanks again for all your questions. Don't forget to like uh, and subscribe to the channel. Share it around and uh, I'll see you next time.